Greetings from Geneva. It's a great pleasure to join you today, even if it is electronically, for this very exciting event and one uh, that ties in very closely with uh, some of the priorities which we have already identified for ourselves here at WHO. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about how we're thinking uh, around uh, economic analysis of health and ageing. And uh, what I'm going to go through is uh, highlighted in our world report. Um, and uh, I, some of it I, I think uh, will probably match closely with the way you're thinking. And what I'll try at the end to do is also to guide some or provide some thoughts about how we might move forward. So if you look at our report, you'll find uh, that we're fairly critical about current models. Um, we think they're very simplistic. Uh, often that they reflect negative uh, age-based stereotypes. Uh, and, and they can also result because of that in policy decisions that reinforce those stereotypes. And uh, in doing so, they tend to, uh, to uh, emphasise cost containment at the expense of investments that might uh, have better economic and social outcomes. Uh, so let me explain some, some of the reasons why we are so critical. Um, First of all, there are, there are some very key misconceptions, and if I go through them one by one, the first is this uh, general assumption in political discourse that expenditure on older people is a cost. Um, so what you'll see in our report, that in, instead of thinking about expenditure on older people as a cost, we reframe it as an investment. Uh, and so if you think about things like health systems, long-term care systems, uh, the expenditure on, on education to provide lifelong learning, creating age-friendly environments and social protection and so on, all of these things are actually investments in older people. And if you make those investments, you expect a return. Uh, and the return can be direct in terms of benefits for older people so that they may have good health or uh, greater mobility and more financial security. Uh, but the benefits also hold for society. And those benefits are, are a return on the investment so that uh, in, if you invest in health systems, uh, you can create individual well-being, but also improve workforce participation. Uh, you can uh, allow people to continue as consumers uh, and, and to act as entrepreneurs, to make investments, uh, to have innovative ideas and contributions to society, um, and to have other social and cultural contributions. A and also, in making these investments, you can reinforce social cohesion. Uh, and it's this last point that I often hear in, when I go to places like China, that the investments they're currently making in long-term care and healthcare are investments in social cohesion. So I think it's important to think a little bit differently from the start about expenditure and move from this idea that it's just um, money into a bottomless pit to one where you realise that it's money that you spend with an expectation of a return. The, uh, the next misconception is there is a widespread idea that there is such a thing as a typical older person. And of course, nothing can be further from the truth. So this is uh, data from uh, the Australian Women's Longitudinal Study. And it looks a little bit complex, but if you look in the first instance at, at the dark lines on the outside uh, of uh, these curves, what you will see uh, with increasing age across the bottom axis is that the gap between those lines increases. And that shows that one of the hallmarks of older age is diversity. Older people, are, 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 there's an incredible range in their, uh, their uh, experiences, there's an incredible range in their health status. And so this looks at physical capacity across the life course. Uh, and we, uh, we did similar analysis in our SAGE study, which looks at six low and middle income countries, including India, China, South Africa, Ghana, Mexico, and the Russian Federation. Showed very similar pattern. And it showed that there are some people at the age of 80 who actually have better health than your typical 20-year-old. Um, now, what we want to do, of course, is to try and make as many people as possible experience that good health in older age. But assuming that we won't do that overnight, we will always see this broad diversity. And so policy needs to cater not just for those fit and, and robust older people, but also for those who are frail and, and who, who need significant support and care. The other point we, we make in the report, and you can see on this figure, is that the lines between those outside lines 
are actually how well people uh, are getting uh, along financially. And what you see is that people in the most financial difficulty start at the bottom of, of the curves and stay there across their life course. Uh, and so what this shows is that this diversity of older age is not random. It's very heavily influenced by the cumulative impacts of uh, uh, environmental exposures across their lives, whether they be social or physical. Now, that's important because in terms of responding uh, to needs in older age, we need to make sure we're not just simply reinforcing those inequities. And let me show you uh, how that can happen. This is a figure from the Marmot Report a, a few years ago in the United Kingdom. And what it looks at is um, life expectancy as the top line and disability free life expectancy in different neighbourhoods of the United Kingdom. Uh, and what they've done is to look at neighbourhood deprivation. And so what you see on the left of the graph, uh, and if you just look at the top line with life expectancy, is people who live in poor neighbourhoods tend to live shorter lives than those who live in wealthy neighbourhoods. Uh, and uh, the, you know, the gap there is, is, is around 10 years. Uh, and so this is a reflection on what I was talking about before, the cumulative impact of, of their uh, lifetime exposures uh, of, of living in a more deprived environment uh, has its ultimate impact in terms of how long people live. But probably more importantly, the line at the bottom looks at disability-free life expectancy. So what you can see there is there's an even bigger difference between people who live in deprived neighbourhoods and those who live in, in well-off neighbourhoods. Uh, and um, so that if you have been poor and, and, and so uh, either uh, tend to live or come from a, a low-income background, the chance that you're going to survive into older age with some form of disability is actually quite slim. Now, what you'll see in the middle of this figure, and I think is important for the discussion today, is the band of the existing and planned retirement ages in the UK. And what you can see is that about two thirds of people living in the UK today are already experiencing disability before they reach retirement age. And almost all of them live in poor neighbourhoods. Um, on the other hand, if you increase the retirement age, uh, the, the, you, you will, um, uh, the, the number of people who are already disabled before they reach retirement age will increase significantly. And again, most of those will come from poorer areas. So there's a, there's a core inequity in terms of the, the, the immediate response that's often offered to population ageing, which is to uh, uh, increase uh, retirement ages. There is another inequity in that too, because the people in poor neighbourhoods actually will live for a shorter period of time than the people in wealthy neighbourhoods. So first of all, they, they will find it harder to live without uh, a, uh, um, a pension. And secondly, when they do get to enjoy it, they'll enjoy it for a shorter period than well-off people who probably don't need it as much. Uh, and so there's a double inequity here we need to be thinking about. Um, uh, another manifestation of this idea that there is a typical older person is the widely used notion of a dependency ratio. Uh, frankly, I find this uh, as basically ageist and discriminatory. It's, dependency itself is a meaningless concept when applied to older people. And let me give you a couple of examples why. Um, if you look at the, uh, the European Union in 2009, the uh, denominator of the dependency ratio, the people of traditional working ages, um, and you look at that group, actually a third of them were not, weren't working. And that's real figures from the, United, uh, from the European Union. Uh, on the other hand, in, even in poor countries, older people are significant contributors and can't in any way be thought of as dependent. So, for example, in Kenya, where most people won't have access to a, a pension anyway um, the, and will have to pay for their own health care, the majority of smallholder farmers are 60 years or older. And smallholder farmers are absolutely crucial to food security in Africa. Uh, I don't think that can really be couched as, as a population group that's dependent. And even in the UK, where you have a country which 
with significant expenditure on older people, totaling uh, in 2010 about £136 billion. When you look at the contributions older people make, they actually far exceed that figure. Uh, so that for, for, older people contribute £45 billion of taxation, £10 billion in other direct financial contributions, £76 billion through their consumption, uh, and through other economically tangible contributions like social care and volunteering, another £44 billion, which gives you a net positive from older people of £30 billion. Again, where does the word dependency come from? The third misconception which we uh, try to uh, change people's thinking about uh, is that population ageing is a major driver of healthcare costs. And this may be somewhat surprising to even, even you, uh, you folks out there in, uh, in Asia. Um, the, first of all, uh, when you look at the data, the link between healthcare need, which we know increases with, with age, and healthcare utilisation is actually quite weak, particularly in low income countries. So for example, in Africa, we know that older people are much more likely to have healthcare need. They're much more likely to be sick and require services. But for the same degree of disability, they're much less likely to seek help. So in low income countries, there's already a big disparity between uh, need and, uh, and utilisation. Secondly, even if you look at high-income countries, uh, healthcare utilisation tends to fall after 70, particularly if there are other options available uh, through things like long-term care. And when you look at the um, uh, demographics, a much better predictor of the cost of healthcare is actually the time to death. So the vast majority of health services that a person uses are in the last 18 months of life. And that doesn't matter whether you're 20, 40, 60 or 80. But what does tend to happen is once you get over 60 or so, the amount of money that's spent in that 18 um, months of life is actually uh, also tends to fall. Uh, and so there was a very interesting paper in the BMJ a few years ago, which looked at demographic change in the United Kingdom from the perspective of time to death. And if you look at that, the demographic changes which you will see with population ageing actually lead to fewer people in the last 18 months of life and less pressure on healthcare costs, which is quite different from the way that, that uh, uh, is often portrayed in the media in terms of the economic impacts of population ageing. Finally, uh, the relationship between age and cost is very different for different systems. Um, so let me give you a couple of figures to, to show you uh, how this works out in, in real life. This, this is data from the Torbay um, municipality in, in the United Kingdom. And what you see here is the spending on people by age group. And naturally, it does seem to increase across life. Um, if you look at hospital-based services, here you see the figures that I was talking about, that after about the age of 70, however, the, the expenditure on hospital-based services tends to fall. That, that it does tend to be filled in by, uh, partly by the expenditure on community-based services. But what you see is left is long-term care. And if long-term care is available, whatever form, it allows options for older people to choose rather than a hospital or intensive community-based services. This is important because I think when we're uh, looking at health expenditures, we can't see that as divorced from the need uh, uh, and provision of social care. Uh, the next figure, and I'm a bit loath to put this up because I, I don't think this is very accurate data, but it does convey a very real trend, um, is when people compared per capita healthcare costs and their relationship with age, it's very different according to the health system that you and, and the culture that you live in. And so what you see down the bottom is typical European increases in costs with age, which are substantial but moderate. But they're completely dwarfed when you look at the relationship of age with healthcare costs in the United States. And partly that is 
that many people in the United States die in intensive care rather than uh, lower cost settings. Uh, and also there, there tends to be in the health system in the United States pressures to intervene at all cost or at any cost. Um, and so the system that you put in place is a very big influence on, uh, uh, on, on this relationship. And, and again, what that means is you can't just generalize uh, and apply uh, this notion of a very steep increase in cost with age to every system in the world. Um, finally, if you look historically, uh, the evidence also supports the fact that aging is really only a minor influence on increasing growth, uh, increases in healthcare expenditure. So if you look at the United States between 1940 and 1990, which incidentally was a period of um, uh, faster aging than the United States is currently experiencing, 2% of that growth could be accounted because of the aging, uh, by, by the uh, aging of the population. The, vast, the vastly biggest driver was technology-related changes in medical practice, practice um, increasing wealth in the community because the richer you are, the more you tend to spare on health, spend on health care, uh, and just increasing prices. Uh, and so blaming ageing for the unsustainability of health systems is really... Um, uh, exaggerating the impact that, that demographic change will have. So what we summarise in our report is by saying um, there are a lot of misconceptions. Unfortunately, the data we have to answer many of the costs, uh, many of the questions which need to be asked is very poor. And what we will be moving forward with at uh, WHO over the next few years is trying to fill some of those gaps. And I think as we do that, and I thought what I would uh, leave you with would be some of the things which I think we really need to know as, as, uh, uh, as, we, as we try and fill those gaps. Um, the first is, what are the real costs of investing in, in healthy ageing? Uh, how much is, uh, are we actually, what, how, much, how big an investment are we making in different areas? But more importantly, what are the costs of not investing in healthy ageing? So if we don't invest in healthy ageing, what is the cost for the older person in terms of their health and well-being? What is the cost to their family in terms of the need to provide care or the loss of an income? And what is the cost for society in terms of uh, the impact on socioeconomic development in terms of lost income from the older person and also uh, the uh, restrictions, particularly on women, of their ability to participate in the workforce and, 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 and other ways because they need to provide social care. Um, on the other hand, what are the real contributions of older people? The data I showed you from uh, England is, earlier is one of the very few studies in this area. Uh, and you know, the, I have to say, I think it's, it uh, could probably be, t be tighter in terms of its analysis. Um, so what we really need to do is get a much better handle on what are the contributions in older people and not just in high income countries, also in low and middle income countries. The next question is, how does this all add up to the impact that population aging will have on healthcare costs? Uh, and, and how does this vary between systems? And which system has the best return on the investment? Because if we know that, then we can know what to advise countries around the world in terms of the sorts of systems they should be trying to build. Uh, another question is, what are the real costs and benefits of different systems of long-term care? Uh, often, particularly when I go to Asia, I hear people say, well, look, here things are different. Here family looks after older people. Uh, and there's an assumption that if family looks after older people, that doesn't come at a cost. Well, it does come. It comes at a big cost um, because, first of all, the older person may not be receiving the care they need. Uh, secondly, it requires somebody to provide that care who can no longer participate in the workforce, whether it's uh, a woman or a child who can't go to school to look after their grandmother. Um, and, and so there are, there are many impacts of not making those investments and we need to actually be able to measure them. Finally, if we are to take, make different interventions, whether they be to promote health, whether they be to treat disease, or whether they be to foster functional ability in older people with significant losses of capacity through long-term care, we actually need much better ways of assessing the benefits of those interventions and comparing the costs and the benefits so that we know where the, best, where the uh, most appropriate investments are to make. So 
this is just touching on, I think, many of the gaps which need to be filled. Uh, I'm really uh, pleased that uh, HelpAge has taken the initiative to, to move on this area uh, in, in, uh, within the, the Southeast Asian region. Uh, and uh, I look forward to hearing back from the meeting. We uh, ourselves will be uh, uh, developing a small working group with uh, uh, some of the other uh, key stakeholders in this area to try and map how we move forward and we're hoping also uh, to be taking some concrete action on, on filling these gaps in the next two years. Um, the, what many of you may know is that a Global Strategy and Action Plan will be considered by our World Health Assembly in a, in a couple of uh, months time. We're confident because it went through our executive board that it will be signed off by member states and it really maps a whole lot of actions that need to be taken over the next five years. The idea is that that can help us position us so that by 2020 the world is in a place to take concerted action on a decade of healthy ageing. What we need for that decade is clear measures that we can hold members, our member states accountable to in terms of their performance. So I don't think in the 21st century it's any longer appropriate just to say, well, we need to do all these things. We need countries to say we will do them and we need to have ways of measuring whether they're doing them or not and we need to hold them accountable to that. And so I think this whole field of economics is a crucial area um, in terms of trying to help us identify what those indicators might be. So I think this is a terrific uh, idea of HelpAge. I'm sorry I can't be there personally and uh, I can't wait to hear uh, uh, a summary of all the discussions that you're going to have. Uh, I'll see you later.